everyone. Hi, I'm Andrea Garber, I'm the Executive Director of Guild Hall, and I'm thrilled to see you all indoors today. Um, so I'm just delighted to tell you that this is the first collaboration, I think the first presentation um, of the church, which will be opening in Sag Harbor in the near future. And it's a really fascinating kind of hybrid arts residency maker space that was um, developed by Eric Fischel and April Gornick. Um, and also, Eric happens to be on the board of Guildhall, and he's also the president of our Academy of the Arts. Are there any Academy members in the audience if you could raise your hand? Okay, fantastic, quite a few here. So the Academy was founded in 1985 by Roy Lichtenstein, Elaine de Kooning, Henry Geldzaller, Peter Jennings, and a number of other artists and writers and creative professionals who kind of came together to support Guildhall and its mission. So as the president of the Academy, Eric's done a number of really important things for a guild hall. And one is he helped establish our artist in residence program, which started in 2016. And I think we have at least one resident here. Art, are you here? Right there. Art Menorah Nile. So through this program, we bring in eight artists per year um, who are early to mid-career, and they develop work um, in response to being in this community. So um, I just wanted to say that Guildhall has always been for and by artists. Um, a patron recently told me when I said Guildhall was founded in 1931, he came up after the show and he said, you know that was in the middle of the Depression. And what I realized is that our gracious founder provided the land and the building, but then there was no money for operating, um, and no endowment. So from the very start, Guildhall was a community effort. So artists, writers, and volunteers really ran the program here. And that's what you see in our history. Um, Edward Albee directing uh, the John Drew Theater in the 70s. Alfonso Osorio hanging art in our member show in 1949, which included the work of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. So there's this incredible storied history here that continues through the leadership of artists like Eric Fischel who organized this panel with my wonderful assistant, Elise Trucks. So please welcome our panelists and Elise to introduce the program. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you all for coming. I'm Elise Trucks. I'm assistant to the executive director and the liaison to the Academy of the Arts, and I helped Eric Fischel organize this panel. Uh, our discussion will be moderated today by Eric, but first our panelists will each speak to tell you a little bit about themselves and their work. And I'm honored to introduce them in alphabetical order, the order in which they'll be speaking. Co-managing partner and co-founder of MSD Capital, Glenn Furman is an investor whose philanthropic efforts in the arts are remarkably expansive. Visionary collector, founder of the Flag Art Foundation in 2008, Furman and his wife Amanda foster ideas and broader access to culture at large. Among their many achievements in this area, the Furmans underwrote the largest continuous free public Wi-Fi network in 2013 across Harlem, the Harlem Free Wi-Fi Project. In 2018, they doubled the, contempor the Contemporary Austin Biennial Prize or the Suzanne Gilbert Flag Art Foundation Prize, which now offers some of the most generous support in the world to ambitious contemporary art projects. And they sponsor free entry to the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. Mr. Furman serves as trustee of MoMA, the Tate Americas Foundation, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, and the 92nd Street Y. Next on the panel, Dorothy Lichtenstein is president of the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, dedicated to the encouragement of a broad understanding of the art of Roy Lichtenstein and the artists of his time. Established after the artist's untimely death in 1997. After studying art history at Arcadia University, Mrs. Lichtenstein became director of the pioneering Bianchini Art Gallery, organizing exhibitions and projects with emerging pop art, and with William Copley, edited and published portfolios of artist works for the Letter Edged in Black Press. Dorothy Lichtenstein remains committed to art and culture as she serves on the board of Studio in a School and Studio Institute, the board of directors of the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, the board of directors of Trisha Brown Dance Company, the board of directors of the Stony Brook Foundation, and the board of directors of FAPE, the International Advisory 
Board for Longhouse Reserve, the Director's Advisory Council of Mass Mocha, and the Advisory Committee for the Polly Krasner Study, House and Study Center. She's a lifetime trustee of the Parish Art Museum, and she's equally committed to scientific research. Uh, Dor Dor Dorothy Lichtenstein is a recipient of the Chevalier of Arts and Letters from the French government. And she's been an excellent sponsor of Fields Hall uh, and our museum. Thank you. Next on our panel, I introduce Rick Lowe. Rick Lowe is a Houston-based artist who's exhibited and worked with communities nationally and internationally. His work has appeared in Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, Museum of Contemporary Arts Los Angeles, Newberger Museum and Purchase, Phoenix Art Museum, Kwanju Biennale in Kwanju, Korea, the Kumamoto State Museum in Kumamoto, Japan, the Venice Architecture Biennale, and Documenta 14 in Castle, Germany, and Athens, Greece. He's best known for his project Row Houses, community-based art project in Houston. Additional community projects include the Watts House Project in Los Angeles, the Borough Project in Charleston, the Delray Beach Community Cultural Loop in Florida, and Anyang Public Art Program in Anyang, Korea. <coughs> Among Rick's honors are the Rudy Bruner Award in Urban Excellence, the American Institute of Architects Keystone Award, the Heinz Award in Arts and Humanities, the Skokegan Governor's Award, and a U.S. Artist Booth Fellowship. He has served as a Lowe Fellow at Harvard, a Mel King Fellow at MIT, an Auburn University Breeden Scholar, and a Stanford University Haas Center <coughs> Distinguished Visitor. President Barack Obama appointed Rick to the National Council of the Arts on the Arts in 2013. In 2014, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. And finally, I turn to our moderator, Eric Fischel, the president of our academy. Internationally acclaimed Eric Fischel's painting and sculpture is represented in the collections of many of the world's most excellent museums, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney, the MoMA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, St. Louis Museum, the Musée Beaubourg in Paris, Louisiana Museum in Denmark, and numerous private and corporate collections, including the Payne Weber Collection, among others. His work has been featured in over a thousand publications. He's among the most influential figurative painters of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Fischl has collaborated with other artists, some of whom are here tonight, including E.L. Doctorow, or today, excuse me, Allen Ginsberg, Jamaica Kincaid, Jerry Saltz, and Frederick Tutton. For that, Eric is a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and, Scientists, and Sciences. We are lucky and pleased to have him as the president of our Academy of the Arts here at Guildhall. And he and his wife, April Gornick, are the founders of the church, our co-presenter today in Sag Harbor, an experimental arts community now in its formative period. We're very proud to present this new series, Art as Ecosystem, in association with the church. And Eric will now tell you a little bit about his ideas for the series, and then we'll hear from each of our panelists about what they've done, what they do, and what's at stake for them, why they do what they do, before we return to Eric for the moderated discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elise. And, uh, I just want to say before I start with the description of what I'm thinking about for this panel, <clears throat> that when I got a call and was asked to become, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, uh, president of the academy, they didn't tell me I had to work for it. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, <laughs> uh, I just uh, want to say if, uh, uh, something about this idea of art as ecosystem. And uh, a friend of mine, Mary Jane Marcassiano, uh, pointed out to me the other day that there's a fundamental difference between a network and an ecosystem. And she said a, ne a network is a, a tethering or a linkage of, uh, of parts that connect because of similar interests but are not dependent on each other for survival. And an ecosystem, everything in the multiverse, from the smallest to the largest aggregates, are all codependent on the health and survival uh, of that system. Now, the art world is a vast ecosystem that does not begin with a work of art 
or end with the work of art, but has art at its center. An art supply store supplies products that go into art making, but does not differentiate between amateur and professional. A museum may only care about historical art, or ethnic art, or contemporary art, and not care about the artists outside of that purview. Artists, as we know, only care about themselves. <laughs> He's, uh, who writes this shit? <laughs> these, uh, these aggregates are only a small part of the art world, which also includes art education, patronage, curators, galleries, collectors, <clears throat> publishers, fabricators, foundries, art handlers, art carriers, storage facilities, insurance companies, lighting designers, studio maintenance products, art restoration sciences, art fraud detectives, art and grant making foundations, artist residents, construction companies, architects, auction houses. I'm sure I'm leaving something out here, but uh, as you can see, it's a vast and codependent system. And um, the reason that I'm wanted to sort of put some stuff together to talk about the ecosystem is to move away from what's become a, an almost obsessive uh, focus on a, uh, what is ultimately a very small aspect of the art world, which is the, the extraordinary sort of financial uh, 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 scale of the system and uh, the one that draws all the highlights. But, it, but as you can see from just describing what's all in this world that we're all a part of, uh, it, it's far more uh, complicated, far more um, uh, positive in terms of a nurturing system for the culture itself. And, uh, and so that's what I'd like to talk about in today's panel. <clears throat> focuses a, a bit on philanthropy as a, as a positive place to start thinking about uh, art in a different way. And we're very lucky to have these three people here who come to philanthropy from different, uh, different places. And we're going to uh, talk sort of generally, or they're going to talk specifically about their philanthropic work. And then we're going to talk sort of generally uh, about um, the nature of community and, uh, and the relationship of art to community and the giving back to the community, et cetera, how one identifies community. So why don't, why don't we start by uh, Glenn talking about uh, what you do. And... All right, great. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you all for letting us be here today. Um, I'll be brief and try to just run through some of the activities uh, of me and my family since coming to New York. Um, I moved to New York in uh, 1988, graduating from the Wharton Business School with a degree in finance and art history, which turned out to be a perfect combination. I didn't realize it at the time. And uh, immediately joined the Junior Associates at MoMA, which in 1990 was the founding year, so it was kind of a, a, a great place to start and get involved today. I'm now a trustee of MoMA, as was, uh, was said before, and it's really been a great kind of base for, for a lot of my art activities. Um, I stay connected to my university museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, and uh, maintain myself as a trustee there, but uh, a little, almost a decade ago, we decided to convert from a admission paying museum to a free museum through uh, some underwriting that we provided. And it was really a great thing because now the attendance went dramatically higher. Uh, it, it changed the whole structure of how the museum operates and really became an example for a lot of other museums around the country that follow a similar path. So it was a great, it was a great thing to see that kind of uh, uh, um, leadership kind of example setting that was, was, was productive in other places around the country. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started the Flag Art Foundation. Eric signed a bunch of catalogs out front if anybody wants to buy them to support Guildhall. Uh, but uh, the Flag Art Foundation is on 25th Street in New York. It's a little bit different than a lot of other collectors' uh, foundations in that we don't show specifically my collection. Uh, we actually invite a different curator in uh, each time to provide a different perspective, and we borrow the works just like any museum exhibition. Uh, we also take a little bit of a unique approach in not sticking just to traditional 
uh, curator of this is Shaquille O'Neal, who we invited to curate an exhibition about scale in contemporary art. And this is called this piece. Uh, the show is called Size Does Matter, and here Shaquille is on this spectacular work by Robert Thierry, who just passed away. Um, and this was a really beautiful exhibition for us to work uh, work on. Eric Fischel curated a great show for us about five years ago called Disturbing Innocence, uh, which is another outstanding show. Um, uh, so this is just a little bit about how we live with art. You know, we are very much all about art in our family. This is one room in our house that we um, installed with the work of Jim Hodges in our collection. It's about 30 works. And uh, we were able to do this before we had children. And uh, because my wife was so understanding and, and, and equally passionate about it, I, or, or at least in allowing it to happen, uh, this room is now our twins' bedroom. Uh, so it doesn't look anything like this now, but uh, in a nice poetic uh, way, Jim Hodges became the godfather to our twins, so they still have a connection to Jim Hodges. Uh, this is another, another direct view of the room. Uh, about 15 years ago, I met a young contemporary artist named Ewan Gibbs who at the moment was going through um, I don't know, financial crisis sounds too strong, but he had uh, decided to leave his three galleries, or his three galleries were not uh, around anymore. And he had just had a child, and he was very you know, kind of concerned about his economic future. And I was a huge fan of his work. Um, and we made an agreement that um, we would uh, really enter into a very unusual relationship, whereby he, he right now is only making about five works a year. And so the idea being that I would buy two works from him every single year, um, potentially for the rest of his life and for the rest of my life, and then assemble this incredible body that will be the, the definitive work of this one person's artwork. And since then, he has now signed up with a lot of major galleries, and he doesn't need this kind of relationship, but he really wants it to continue. So now, 15 years later, you know, I have 30-plus works by him. Um, and, and kind of have this vision of one day assembling this entire trove of, of, of masterworks from one artist and giving them to the Tate or another museum that would really have a unique ability to kind of show a life of an artist in, in, from one collection. Uh, the Flag Art Foundation, and again, in terms of community, you know, it does allow a lot of integration with other parts of our philanthropic efforts. So here you see a group of students from the Harlem Children's Zone, which is another um, charter school that we support in Harlem. Uh, in discussion with a young artist that we support, uh, actively named Awal Arizku, who's from the Bronx, uh, originally a family from Ethiopia, um, but this was a, a discussion and a program that we had at FLAG. Um, as was mentioned, my wife and I um, underwrote and designed a free Wi-Fi network through 95 square blocks in Harlem with the support of Mayor Bloomberg, and, uh, and here we did it also in conjunction with the Harlem Children's Zone, which was a super, super successful program. Uh, my business partners and I, uh, about six or seven years ago, uh, were able to acquire the Magnum Archive. This was the entire archive, 400,000 photographs from Henry Cartier Bresson. This is from Robert Kappa, uh, Elliot Irwin, a whole bunch of legendary photographers. And uh, over a period of time, we're able to get all these works and then donate them to the Ransom Center at the University of Texas in Austin. And so now this entire trove is available to the public. Anybody can go in and have access to all these images and, uh, and study and, and do some great things. And it's a super, super fun project to work on. Uh, we also support a lot of things in criminal justice reform. Uh, this is a group of inmates uh, at a maximum security prison in upstate New York as part of the Barred Prison Initiative, the idea being that these, these, these inmates can become students and actually get a real college degree from Bard University and graduate and come out of prison with the hope of having a job and a life and not having to go back to, to any criminal activity if they can come out with self-esteem and the ability to get a job and support themselves in their community. This debate team here is either they're debating a debate team from Harvard, and they actually won the debate, which was amazing. And they, they debate every year West Point. They debate in Cambridge this year, and they have an incredible track record. And they're not allowed to do any research on the internet, because in prison you have no access to the internet. So it's kind of amazing. And then it connected and, and really to the point of community, you know, when Aggie Gus Gunn did her Art for Justice initiative, we immediately signed on as founding members. And so again, this kind of art community and this connection across many of our areas of philanthropy was, 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 uh, was a, good, that was a great example. We love public art. Uh, we supported the Ola for Eliasson installation of waterfalls years ago with the Public Art Fund. We underwrote this Ease Against, in, Ease Against in piece that was installed in front of Central Park. 
Uh, Carmen Herrera, 104 years old, still going strong. Uh, last week just opened a series of monumental sculptures at City Hall Park, which we helped to underwrite, which I encourage everybody to see. But by far, our favorite uh, public sculpture that we've ever helped uh, with is this spectacular work at the parish. <laughs> and, uh, we got to work out with Dorothy, and uh, every time myself and my family drive by this, we, we fill with joy. It's, uh, it just is such a beautiful part of the community out here. Uh, we. Uh, uh, helped to get this movie made called The Killer Bees about the basketball team in Bridgehampton. I brought in my friend Shaquille O'Neal as executive producer, and it's an incredible story. I mean, the town of Bridgehampton High School has about 45 kids in the whole high school, so like 10 per grade, and yet they feel the team that's won nine state championships. So it's a spectacular story and was really a satisfying thing to work on. Uh, Nicole Eisman won our Suzanne Dill Booth Flag Art Foundation Prize, which we just started, and she wins $200,000 in an outright grant and a museum show in New York and Austin, Texas. And then we're working on something very exciting right now to celebrate uh, some amazing teachers in the New York City public school system. This is just information, and literally we just decided to do something about two weeks ago, so it's a little bit early to, to, to kind of get into the details. But we, we all read about you know, the struggles of the public school system, and, and, and we want to do something to celebrate success and excellence in public school teaching. And so that's something that we're going to announce in the fall, hopefully. And then again, on the film side of things, um, we have been doing something very unusual. We decided to remake the movie Diner, uh, the Barry Levinson classic from 1982, which took place in Baltimore in 1959. We decided to remake it, set it in Harlem in 2019, but use amateur actors in the cast that are from the Harlem Children's Zone, which we work with, and that are in this Hyman Brown Senior Center in, um, at the 92nd Street Y. And that's the cast, these amateur actors, to watch these two communities that don't typically interact really get to know each other on a film set for what turned out to be five or six months of time. And so I'm just gonna show 90 seconds of the movie. Uh, and keep in mind, these are amateur actors, and this is just you know, the first people to ever see this. It's still not even having the editing room, but uh, this is a, a snippet from the movie. statistically more happy than people that spend their money on themselves. And I look at all the things that I just went through, and it is totally, outside of my family, that is a source for all the happiness in my life. And so I would totally agree with that. Congratulations. That was actually wonderful. Um, so, uh, 
my husband, Roy, passed away kind of unexpectedly, and we did not have a foundation. Uh, we gifted, I mean, we supported various organizations, and um, we, um, but we had a plan that if one of us passed away, the other would form a foundation. And uh, his death was kind of sudden and unexpected. Uh, and uh, I inherited a lot of this work and really had to find a repository for it uh, in case something were to happen to me. Uh, we have already taken care of our children uh, in various ways. So um, I did form a foundation and I really had no idea what to do and at least I knew that I didn't know. And I thought I'd have to, I knew I had to find a director and I was very lucky that we had a relationship uh, with a man named Jack Coward who we met in the 70s. He had done an exhibition of Roy's work for the decade 1970 to 1980. We traveled with him, uh, we enjoyed his company, and he went on to work at the National Gallery of Art. Uh, at that time, they were not allowed to exhibit the work of living artists or buy work of living artists, and he arranged to borrow work from a number of artists and <coughs> exhibit it. Uh, and then he went on to be deputy director of the Corcoran uh, Museum. And of course, he was the person I thought of immediately, but I thought, hmm, Museum Artists Foundation. <laughs> but he was only too happy, I think, to escape the bureaucracy. Uh, and he came to work with us. So I had the great advantage, really, of having someone who had been a curator, had been an administrator, and really had, you know, traveled, who knew museum directors all over the world, who really knew about administration. Um, so that was just uh, really a great help. And we um, said, uh, he had one great idea. Uh, when he, he, We started the foundation in 1999. Roy passed away in 97. Uh, one idea he had was to call up directors of other uh, artist foundations uh, that, um, and to meet with them. So we hosted a lunch and invited them all to come. And our idea was to share information and to um, invite living artists if they wanted to come to ask questions or just sit in on these uh, meetings. Uh, but we um, had this notion, I mean, our mission was for further understanding of the art of Roy Lichtenstein and the art of his time. I was really wondering how we were going to fulfill that second part when a, a, a photographic trove fell, uh, kind of fell into our lap. Uh, there were two artists, Harry Schunk and Janusz Kander, who were, one was a German refugee, the other was a Hungarian refugee. They met in Paris and they started really photographing the artist Eve Klein uh, in great depth and Armand, some of the European artists. In fact, Roy had an exhibition in the 60s at the Anasanaben Gallery and they had taken photographs of that. Uh, so, and then they came to New York through Canada and had all these historic photographs and uh, Harry passed away suddenly and the person who was an appraiser who had worked with us after Roy passed away stopped by one day and told us about this and we went immediately to uh, to look at the work, and I mean, I opened a box and there was a picture of Bob Rauschenberg and Jasper and Merce Cunningham and another box had Andy and um, it had many of these French artists. So she had approached the Getty and the International Center of Photography and the Centre Pompidou, but 
I guess they really couldn't act quickly and immediately hit me that this was really a way to represent the artists of Roy's time. Uh, and so we, we put a bid in and <laughs> we, we were actually the only bidders. <laughs> the, uh, uh, they advertised this auction. The, there was no will, uh, Harry died in test day. And so they advertised, I think, four Sundays in the business section of the New York Times. Um, I don't know who all saw it. But we were able to acquire that. And I mean, it was pretty enormous. There were hundreds of thousands of photographs and slides. And um, so we immediately had to hire an archivist. Uh, and I mean, that was another learning experience. We actually did hire an archivist. Uh, we, at, at the end of having it all in form, we wound up, and this was Jack's idea, to gift it to a consortium. So we gave a complete set and the copyright to the Getty, and they worked with the Museum of Modern Art. The Museum of Modern Art picked the images they wanted. And then we gave another complete set to the Pompidou, and they worked with the Tate in London. And um, so it was really great to put that out into the world. In fact, uh, the Pompidou just did an exhibition. Uh, so uh, I, we never really thought about how long we were going to last. Or I mean, we had our mission, which was to publish a catalog resume of Roy's work. Uh, and, we said about that. Uh, but after a while, I did think about winding down for a number of reasons, uh, maybe the biggest one, that we really wouldn't have the resources to go on indefinitely. Um, and uh, because I was the sole supporter of the uh, foundation, which I, I mean, I wanted to be, and I knew Roy would want it to be that way. Um, so, uh, there are other things that I, I support. When I started the foundation, it's a private operating foundation, I didn't really want it to be confused with things that I personally believe and I wanted to keep it involved with the arts and kind of keep it on track. Uh, and while it does make some gifts, they're usually related. Um, we made, um, well, the Schunkender uh, archive was a gift, and uh, we just gifted Roy's um, archives to the Archives of American Art, along with the grant to uh, help to help them with digitizing, you know, the work of minorities that they have in their collection that haven't been digitized yet. Um, so, the, I mean, the, I have to say I've really learned a lot by doing, I learned a lot by being on other foundations. I mean, I learned an enormous amount from my friend Aggie Gund, uh, from being on the board of studio in the school with her, and uh, now vice chair of the Studio Institute, where we're trying to bring that program to other cities around the country. Um, it's very exciting because the, this is, again, is a, a, a program that works in the most underserved public schools in the city, uh, and it's really helpful. Uh, I've been on the board of the, Bob Rauschenberg was a really good friend. Uh, I learned a huge amount by being on the board, first with their director, Christine Gleer, and uh, now uh, with Kathy Halbright, the new director. So uh, it's really been a, a kind of a voyage for me of, um, of learning. I mean, I have, I, I'm so glad that I could take a part in this. I mean, I um, maybe didn't think out my own personal giving that clearly, um, but um, it really doesn't make that much difference. I have to agree uh, totally with Glenn that 
Uh, it fe it's actually felt so good to be able to support these things and see a difference made. Um, I, I mean, I think it's kind of addictive. I do it because it, it actually feels better, and I think I have become, definitely have become a happier person uh, as a result of it. Thanks. Okay, um, well, thanks for having me here. When I was first, uh, when I first talked to Eric about doing this, we talked about, you know, uh, art as ecosystem and talked about Project Grow Houses, kind of, I think that's kind of what he wanted me to talk about, but, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I really like to talk about things that I'm really most excited about at the time, and with Project Grow Houses, which is a big part of my life, has shaped my career and all. But, um, but after 25 years, I stepped away from it. And so, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that's, that's happening. So what I decided to do instead of talking about that is just on the screen behind me, it will just be uh, images from Project Grow Houses. It's gonna rotate through, be from Project Grow Houses, but then there's gonna be images from uh, a project that I did in Dallas, Texas called Translation, Vickery Meadow. And then there's gonna be a, um, images of the project that I started in Athens through Documenta uh, in Victoria Square. So those are just gonna run in the background. So while I prepare myself to talk about what I'm really excited about, which is, uh, which actually, and I, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at my, my, I'm just, I started out painting, and that was one of the other things that was interesting when Eric called me was that, you know, when I started studying painting in the early 80s, I mean, he, this was God I look at, you know, I was like, oh my God, you know, and then I get an email from like, I, I emailed back, I think I did say this, like, are you like the Eric official? <laughs> He's like, yep, that's me, and I was like, oh my God, so anyway, so I was a little starstruck to you. But, um, but anyway, but what was interesting though is that, that I, you know, just since leaving Project Horizons, I've started painting again, you know, and stuff, and it's so interesting, that's something I'm really excited about, I'm sure my Houston-based art dealer who's sitting here in the front row probably wish I was talking about my paintings, <laughs> but, but, I'm, but I'm really, I'm going to stick with something that's relevant to the topic, which is uh, art as ecosystem. And, um, but it's, um, I'm gonna, but I'm going to talk about it in relation to a project that I'm beginning, and I'm really excited about it, and it is about ecosystems in the black community, but, um, but I'm going to tie it into art as I go through it. But, I don't know how many of you know about the Tulsa riots, Tulsa massacre in uh, 1921. Yeah. Show of hands, any, any, anybody know? And uh, that was a, uh, also, it was called Black Wall Street back in 1921. An entire neighborhood of 35 blocks was completely burned to the ground. And um, a pretty devastating part of uh, African American history. And it was one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in the country. Therefore, it was called Black Wall Street. And uh, the centennial was coming up in 2021. Well, what was, uh, I was asked by the city of Tulsa if I would help them kind of shape an art component to the centennial. And while I'm interested in the massacre, what was most interesting for me about that whole time frame was that not that the place was burned and people were killed and destroyed, what was most interesting for me was that those people came back. 11,000 people were displaced, whatever. And most of them came back, and they rebuilt Greenwood, the Greenwood District, Black Wall Street, bigger and stronger than it was before. And to me, I was so excited about that because that shows that's a testament to the kind of resilience, innovation, and passion of African Americans that we have to like deal with throughout you know our time in this country. And so I left there with this idea, of thinking about wanting to explore this idea of what would Black Wall Street look like in the 21st century. And, uh, you know, and I just started kind of playing around with this idea, and I had this opportunity in Chicago that's coming up. There's a, uh, the MacArthur Foundation is doing a 40th anniversary exhibition of artists, of the uh, MacArthur Fellows, and they asked me if I wanted to participate. And for some reason, many different things pushed me toward Chicago to, to explore this question of what would Black Wall Street look like in the 21st century. Part of it being that a lot of the descendants from Tulsa ended up in Chicago, and you know, Chicago's been a very strong base for uh, uh, African-American economic uh, 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 
you know, base or economic uh, wealth in African American communities. And so, so I, uh, so the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago is going to put on this exhibition for the uh, uh, the MacArthur Foundation. And so I went there to start kind of exploring, and uh, and I've come up with something that I'm really excited about about kind of using a framework of art to talk about this ecosystem and what you know Black Wall Street would look like in the 21st century. But first of all, just to say something about Black Wall Street historically was that it was this kind of ecosystem of support where all segments of the African-American community really relied on each other, you know, the wealthiest to the lowest. I mean, there was this kind of, because kind of trapped through segregation, so everybody had to kind of make sure the neighborhood was kind of, you know, was kind of working together. And, um, you know, we've lost that. So to me, that's one of the big steps to explore, to look at, you know, what how can we do this in the 21st century? So as I've been looking around and talking to people, um, I met this young uh, uh, real estate developer there who, who was telling me that, we were talking about reparations one day, and he said, you know, reparations already happening from my view. He said, reparations is the fact that I can go into the city of Chicago, south side of Chicago, and I can find all this land that the city just want to get rid of. I mean, you know, they own it, they want to get rid of it. I can get it for almost nothing, but I have to hustle. I have to hustle to turn it into something. And, uh, and he's amassed a lot of real estate and, you know, and really trying to make it work. And he also sees the role that art can play in terms of helping to hold that real estate, keep it, give it some vitality before it you know, goes on to the development stage. So we're sitting there and we're talking, and then I started thinking about some, uh, a friend of mine, uh, that, uh, Theaster Gates, who uh, renovated an old bank on Stony Island Avenue, and he called it the Stony, Ave Stony Island Arts Bank. And as I've been meeting artists in Chicago, you know, I'm thinking, and I said, you know, maybe we should, we could turn this bank, arts bank that's really used for more exhibition and performance stuff, maybe we can turn this into like a real arts bank, right? And so, we're in the early stages of this, trying to test it out, so I'm just talking it through with you because I'm still trying to think this out. But the idea is that, you know, we'll go and we'll get, you know, artists, all strata of artists from uh, Chicago and have them develop um, uh, to invest or deposit one work into that bank per year. Just one work. And, you know, we'll be able to accumulate value of that art sitting in the bank, and twice a year we'll, we'll try to make it liquid, you know, we'll try to sell some of that. And then the proceeds of that, of that, um, uh, that work that we could make liquid, then we'll go back to those developers who are rebuilding the community and be able to provide funds for artists to actually, the, the street level artists who are, who are willing to go out and do the murals or the, you know, sculpture in vacant lots and that kind of stuff, to be able to help those developers do the work that they're doing to try to sustain the neighborhood. And then in the process, they'll go back to the bank and buy more work. You know, so it's kind of creating this, this, this circular motion where everybody's kind of tied into it. And the point of doing that is to be able to send a symbolic message to the broader African American community, uh, the business community, because this, this uh, young developer was, was telling me how he bought this beautiful, uh, bank on 55th Street in, uh, on the south side of Chicago. It was a bank that, you know, they were trying to, I mean, a, a building they were trying to get rid of. It's called the Schultz Bakery. It's like a seven-story, beautiful Art Deco building. And uh, he got it for nothing. But he couldn't find anybody to invest with him on it. Until he, he got somebody from New Jersey, he got somebody from California, so he finally put together some folks, and now he's turning it into, a, you know, uh, uh, a significant real estate deal, but he was saying, you know, but you know, I should have to do that. You know, there are lots of people, lots of African Americans in Chicago that should be able to come and invest with me with this. And he said, maybe this art project can kind of be a symbol for them to be able to show how we can link, you know, the people that are at the highest level that are doing really well to the, you know, to folks that are kind of in the middle of the, of the road, and then in an effort to support the people who are at the bottom trying to come up. So that's kind of the that's, that's the thing that I'm really, um, uh, really excited about now, is trying to see how that thing will play out in terms of setting up some kind of ecosystem that mimics that old Black Wall Street 
system within uh, 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 an effort to, uh, to provide an opportunity for the community to, to not, not that it has to rebuild its own with only African American resources, but actually everybody has skin in the game. And that's the point, you know, I mean, there has to be money that comes from the outside, and we have to figure out how to get money to rotate and, and move itself around within the neighborhood. That's it. Thank you. Thank you guys for that. I, I, uh, <coughs> I, I just applaud all the great work that you're all doing in, in that. I, did have a feeling after listening to Glenn go through everything he did, I'd vote for him if you ran for president. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the, the sort of depth of, of uh, civility that runs through your giving, uh, the, the, how, how deep into it it goes through lives and touches or something, uh, you know, we, we're living in a time where it feels like that's strained or lost or, or ignored in some way. So, uh, I was joking about the presidency, but I think you should think about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, how you define community that you're uh, participating in. Some, uh, of it is obvious um, in that it's um, either uh, in Dorothy's case it's about a generation that she's a part of and her husband was a part of a big impact in and so it's about sort of putting in back into that something that solidifies the historical character and, and uh, legacy of it. Uh, we, we're, you know, certainly uh, Rick uh, with his work in Dallas and stuff coming out of his background, his African-American background, identifying very closely with the neighborhood that he both lived in and understood that that's a, a direct uh, sense of community that then expands outward into a national and international uh, one. You, you coming out of both a, uh, a financial uh, background that is connected to uh, to the, uh, the the way the the mechanisms of, of art and uh, through finance, but also very much connected to your Jewish heritage, and uh, and and it's interesting to me. I uh, will start with that as the first question: is to not only identifying the um, the why as a place to connect for community, but more specifically to the elder people in that community, and could you talk as to how that kind of came about for you? Sure, I mean, I think that it all just comes back to your, your earlier point about how we all define our community, because, you know, ultimately, it can start at the very micro, and your community is your own life and your family, and it can go then to your local community, and then your national community, and international community, and it's the world, I and mean, ultimately, we're on, the whole world is, is one community, so it's kind of a starting point. You know, I start with my own family first and foremost. I was very close to all four of my grandparents. They, uh, they were part of my life for a very long time until they, they obviously have now passed away. Uh, but I've always loved and respected and cherished uh, the, the perspectives of, of, of older people. Um, I did something when I was younger called like an adopt a grandparent, where you know, after my grandparents had all passed away, I was randomly assigned a, a homebound elderly person who I would just call once a week. And we never met. We spoke once a week for several years. And uh, we really developed this like a really great bond. And I know how much she looked forward to my call every week. And, uh, and it meant a lot to me to have that call as well. And so I've always just had this community with older people. And, um, and, and you know, I do have a lot of connections through what just growing up in the Jewish community and, 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 and the nature of Sadaka or of giving is just kind of very much at the core of, of the religion. Um, but, you know, it, I, was, I think when I was making this movie, I was thinking, because I'm very actively involved in a lot of African-American causes, 
and I'm also involved in a lot of Jewish causes. And historically, you know, the Jews and, and African American people have had like kind of different types of relationships. I mean, on the one hand, there was a lot of commonality through the civil rights era, uh, but then for, for unbeknownst reasons to me, there's also been lots of conflict and periods of, of disagreement among, among those communities. And I just thought this was an opportunity to do something with two communities in terms of senior, predominantly Jewish senior citizens and African American high school kids that would probably never have any reason to spend time together for them just to interact and maybe learn something from each other, understand each other's community a little bit more, understand each other's you know, life a little bit more, and that could only lead to good things. And that was, I think, the motivation, and that very much happened, um, um, you know, the, the watching the kids on the first day of filming, you know, it was very segregated. All the kids were on one side of the, of the, of the shoot, and all the seniors were on the other side of the shoot. And very quickly, they were exchanging cell phone numbers, they were texting each other. Uh, the you know, people know how to do Yeah, they did. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're they're, 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 they're more texts than any other thing. Um, and so it was, it, was, it, was just, it was just great. They were both, uh, Shaquille O'Neal ended up doing a cameo in the movie, and they were all equally excited to see Shaquille O'Neal, including the seniors. Um, and Barry Levinson, who wrote and directed the original movie, also did a cameo for the movie. And so, you know, watching all these different people get excited about these different things and then share their joy together was very powerful, and it was a great part of the project. And for me, that was as much an output that I was seeking than the actual film itself. It was just the experiential aspect of doing it. And a normal shoot, you know, we had 14 days of shooting, and a normal shoot, that would be two weeks. And this group would be together for two weeks. But because I have a full-time job, I directed this movie, which I had never done before, so I didn't know what I was doing. But, uh, but we only could shoot one day a week at most, because the kids have to go to school and I have to work, so it was pretty much one Saturday a week. So that became 14 weeks, and then by the time we add in holidays and other things, it became a four and a half, five month shoot. So we were together for a very long time, you know, and we really got to know each other very well. One of our lead uh, stars got into his first choice college and we all celebrated him getting into college. And, you know, it was just, there were a lot of things that were, we had a holiday party together. It was just a Some of the really other special. people learned how to text. Yeah, and no, they, do. They, 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 I was surprised at how tech savvy they were, actually. <laughs> I don't know why I'm hung up on this, but. <laughs> Maybe you're talking about yourself, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I, can, I, can I add something to your answer as your wife? <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I think one of the things also with Glenn, it's interesting you mentioned the generational aspect with respect to Judaism, because I think it's something he thinks a lot about preserving something cultural that is precious and finite and exists in a period of time. And not only does he think about the, the broad communities that exist, but the communities to come and the generations to come. And I was not raised Jewish, so I didn't understand what it was to be part of a minority group, like artists, like many other people. And the importance of broadening that community and sharing it and having opportunities to share it, I think is something Glenn thinks about a lot and it sounds like something you all share with respect to the question of how do we actually make the ecosystem of art larger for a greater audience and even more members. Very true. Thank you, Amanda. So no, that, 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 was, that, that was a nice, nice summary. That was good. <laughs> 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 Dorothy, uh, um, talk to me about uh, your sense of community in relationship to that, because I know besides the the, uh, the art world, the pop art era, et cetera, et cetera, you're extremely generous in so many other ways. And well, uh, one thing, uh, I mean, within our meeting community, I mean, Roy's last studio was in West Village, um, and um, as you, you all know, the Whitney Museum has moved down there. And so we've started a relationship with them. They'll have a study center, but they also have the use of, um, we run the foundation out of, well, it's Roy's studio, but we've also had shared events with them, uh, which has kind of brought that part of the art community together. And I'll just talk the foundation. Uh, 
there is um, a woman named Christine Vincent who did a study uh, about artists' foundations. I mean, it now turns out that um, there are many, many artists who have earned enough money to actually form a foundation, and they want to give back. I mean, I, I feel a responsibility that to, to give back. And so she wrote, uh, did this study, and it's actually two 500-page volumes, and it's called um, Best Practices for the Next Generation of Art Artists' Foundations, because many, many artists have started foundations now. I mean, I know that you is, is this out of the Aspen? It's out of the Aspen Institute. Institute. And so we supported that with a number of other foundations that supported it. But uh, I say with uh, Studio in a School, uh, it has a lot of programs in the public schools. They set up an actual studio, but they also do internships, which uh, takes students uh, from both high schools and colleges and hooks them up with the cultural institution uh, in the summer, and they have a paid internship they earn about $3,500, and they work in a particular area. They get to see, I mean, it could be the Brooklyn Museum, which it is, it could be the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the Lincoln Center. Um, so it's any kind of cultural institution, and they actually get up every day and go to work, and they have a project that they complete. And this is what we've, uh, we're trying to bring to other cities. I mean, we've already, started in Cleveland, Memphis, Boston, Providence, Philadelphia. So um, I agree with what Glenn said. I mean, eventually, I mean, I believe our community is actually the planet today. I mean, we really have to think. I have a personal interest in uh, environmental organizations and also uh, animals uh, saving species. Uh, I mean, the news is absolutely dire, and that's <laughs> an overwhelming job, really. But um, I mean, I try to spread information. I mean, I'm concerned. Um, I mean, there is a lot. There's a lot going on. I mean, I serve on the advisory committee for the uh, New York Stem Cell Foundation, uh, and um, I mean, I'm I'm kind of curious to what see if there's so much that can be done, uh, you know, genetically now, and um, there's artificial intelligence which is likely to be guiding us, which is likely to really replace a lot of jobs. I don't think people, you know, have thought about that. So, I mean, I, I feel kind of helpless when I think of the challenges ahead, but I also feel really heartened by, really, people like Rick. I mean, I heard about Project Row Houses a long time, and really what uh, Glenn and Amanda do is uh, incredible. So, I mean, I try to, you know, interest other people. I try to do what I can. I mean, I've, you know, probably done more than I can afford to. Uh, but I had that lesson from the Aggie Gun. And, I mean, it's, I'm not going to go hungry. So, um, I just think it's really important to, you know, put out what, what you have, and um, I mean, so the Hamptons are also, you know, uh, a community where I mean, actually saving the South Harbor Theater, the Guild Hall, the Parish Art Museum, and other cultural institutions. Uh, they're, you know, they're my immediate neighborhood, essentially. So uh, I definitely think it's important uh, to support that. I mean, I feel like I've been blessed, you know, really very lucky. Um, I mean, in the 60s when I first met Roy, an artist thought he or she was well off if they just didn't have to have a day job. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the fact that 
people actually want to buy the art is uh, amazing. You know, it's a, it's a great thing. Well, you know, for me, I um, as it relates to my social and community engaged art practice, you know, I've learned to kind of approach it in a kind of a, a little bit more of a complex way in terms of having one side of it be neighborhood based because most of a lot of my work is neighborhood based, which is pretty that's generally pretty simple to define because you know it's this neighborhood and people know what that is. But then, then there are communities that operate within those neighborhoods, and then it gets more complicated. And it's trying to figure out, you know, okay, so what community do I have some affinity with, or how can I, you know, engage with this community around this particular neighborhood and that kind of stuff. And um, and and as you said earlier, you know, starting and you know, and uh, and Glenn, you, know, you start with your own personal connections. You know, who you are, where you live, your and you, you know, so. Um, in my neighborhood in Houston, when I started Project for Us, it was pretty easy because it was my neighborhood. I lived there, or whatever. But even within that, though, you know, there's like, I think I heard you say this earlier, like something about being out here. You have to be here. You have to be here 100 years before you could be a, a, a you know, considered a, a native. I mean, you know, somebody who's, you know, I mean, so, I, you know, I've been living in a neighborhood for a long time, but I still wasn't considered by some a part of the neighborhood, even though I'm there. So that's these kind of breakdowns. And uh, so what it learned, what I learned from that was, you know, really trying to really figure out what role I can play within whatever community I'm engaging in, and it varies, it differs, you know, from place to place. And generally, it's kind of um, understanding that no matter what I do, no matter how much effort I put into things, I have to allow myself to be placed with in you know, kind of in a support role of neighborhoods that I'm not deeply connected to. So the project in Greece and Athens, it's a, you know, my immediate thing there was to find people who really had, you know, direct stake within the place and, uh, and just to support them. And I'm currently trying to figure out what that role is, I mean, what role I can play in Chicago, because it's a whole different kind of place, you know, so it's, a lot of it is really, you know, giving a lot of thought about that and not going in it with a set idea, understanding of, you know, what I can do, how I need to do it, or whatever, but trying to listen and respond. Yeah, and the, um, outside of sort of setting up a foundation or something like that, uh, and Rick, because you're an artist, you you get an idea and then try to make it happen. Um, but uh, Glenn, in terms of sort of understanding how to give, and once you've identified what it is, and uh, how, how do you s sort of understand a structure for giving that is actually effective? I mean, I think a lot of it, it really does just come down to initiative and creativity, and um, it, it's not that hard to give, you know, if, if you decide you want to. And, you know, I, look, I think there's also just a lot of leadership in the world and it's great that there's now finally really a celebration of giving and leadership and giving and you know Aggie Dunn has been an inspiration to me and it sounds like she has for for uh, Dorothy as well and to many people and you know you look at something that for years like the Forbes 400 is like listing who the richest people are and all the stories about Donald Trump you know trying to fake how rich he was so he could get on the list and and I've always wanted to like well you should be having a list of celebrating the most philanthropic people in the world and having you know challenging people to Should be, it should be more merciless, you know. I mean, we celebrate somebody who gives $100 million to an institution, but they may be worth $30 billion. And, you know, a kid who gives $50 to the Jerry Lewis telephone may be giving more of his money than the person who gave $100 million. So, so I think that's, that's very important. But I really think that it is initiative. We, we did the Harlem Wi Fi project. This is literally how it happened, okay? I read the New York Post on a Tuesday. And there was an article about Google moving a big group of people to New York and Chelsea. And as part of that move, they were going to give free Wi-Fi to the neighborhood of Chelsea around the Google building. And it said in the article how much that was going to cost. And I read that article, and I thought instantly, if there is one place on the planet that does not need free Wi-Fi, <laughs> it's the network of people around the Google headquarters. And so I did the math in my head. I said, OK, well. How much would it cost to apply that math to Harlem? And I thought, we could afford that. 
So I called the mayor's office, cold call, and I said, can I please speak to somebody in the mayor's office about this idea? Three days later, I was in touch with Patty Harris, who's from Mayor Bloomberg's office. She put me in touch with the right people, and the next week we had a, a meeting, and the next week we started the implementation. And it was just because of phone calls. And so, yeah, you have to go to so, there are a lot of things, that, you know, all the things that I listed, a lot of those things, it was just an idea, and then just having the tenacity to just kind of see it through. And you know, the idea of free admission for a museum. I was on the board. I saw how much money the museum took in every year from admission. I'm like, we could just donate that amount. That was it, it within our reach. So why don't we just donate that amount, get rid of, 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 free, of, of, of admission, and then it becomes free, and it's like, what a great thing. So again, not super complicated. I proposed it at the next board meeting. Everybody said, great, let's do it. Yeah, so so uh, I don't know. I just think it's not that hard to come up with ways to give. I do think it, it can be lazily given, and there's lots of stories that you read about. I think Walter Annenberg gave a lot of money away, and most of it went to nothing. I think it's unclear if Mark Zuckerberg's gift to Newark really did that much. You know, I think if you are going to give, you have to follow through and see what is being done. Maybe have partially partial grants, and then the second piece is only done, done if, it's, if, if certain metrics are achieved. And, you know, there is this idea of you know, just writing a check is easy. But you know, seeing something through or having a specific project or making sure it's, it, it's implemented in a good way, because nobody wants to see anything wasted, those are all things that I think you can do as an intelligent giver. Honestly, whether you're giving $100 or $100 million, you can do it in, a, in an intelligent way. Um, I, I want to say, uh, uh, before we turn it over to uh, questions from the audience, uh, and, and thank you, President Furman. <laughs> I, I want to say that uh, I, speaking of uh, small gifts, right? The Sag Harbor Cinema, uh, when it was raising uh, nine million dollars to buy the cinema, uh, a million of it came from fifty dollar, hundred dollar donations. Which, yeah. Shows that there is such a broad base to a pyramid within a community of, of uh, desire and want and need and stuff. So, anyway, I think we should. Uh, I want to respond a little bit to uh, uh, Glenn's thing, and it's it's really interesting to hear you talk about you know giving in that way because it seems like you have a really good understanding that, of something that a lot of people don't is that this notion of proximity to different things that are going on in the world. You know, we live in a society that is so divided in places that people don't have proximity to other things. So they just give to what they know. And what they know is that they, you know, Google, they just know, well, we're here and we just do this. They don't have any proximity to anything else. And so they don't really think about that. They don't think about these possibilities of how you can take resources that you're doing and it would be amplified so much more if you do it in another place. And the reason uh, it was really interesting to hear you say that was because you know, I've run into this thing with Tulsa uh, for their centennial. Uh, you know, Tulsa, um, they have a new park there that's called the Gathering Place. Uh, it's it's uh, an incredible park. I was on a panel with the mayor of Oklahoma City who paused to talk about this great park in Tulsa. He applauded the leadership of the city, the business leadership, all, you know, all this, the vision that they had to do this park, and it was an expensive park, it's called the World Class Park. They spent $450 million on this park. Huge. And he talked about how it was gonna have such an economic impact, it was gonna, you know, tourism and all this stuff. But the problem is, it's on the south side of the city, which is the wealthiest side of the city. And I was sitting there and I was thinking about this, and I, and, and I, I had to challenge him with this, I said, you know, it's, it's a great park, you can't deny it. Amazing, first class. But what if those people who were thinking about doing this park said they were gonna raise $450 million to do this park? What if somebody had said, well, we could do this park, but you know, we have this huge centennial that's coming up, acknowledging of time, about history, whatever. What if, what if we use, what if we raise $450 million and use it as an incentive to rebuild Black Wall Street? 
you know, as an incentive for people, black businesses to come back and to really invest in this. And, um, you know, and I brought that up and, and I brought it up to the city of Tulsa and folks, and, and it was like, they just, you know, they weren't even, it wasn't even something that was a part of their reality to think about because the proximity of their lives is so separated from the north side where the Greenwood neighborhood was that there was no way for them to even connect to that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the, 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 the biggest thing that I got from what you were saying here is really, you know, in making those decisions is about how you live your life. You know, and how you connect your yeah. life to things bigger than where you are. I mean, yeah, but one thing that has facilitated that is certainly the internet. And, you know, there are uh, things like you can give the, um, what, whatever, the what's the fundraising site, that, you know. And those, those Kickstarter, Kickstarter and GoFundMe, those, those things, or... GoFundMe they, they do raise quite a bit of money across very broad geographies. And, and I think the internet can shrink your community uh, from from the global down to, to the micro and and uh, and I do think that's positive. But I, look, I think what you're saying is important to, to try to expand your universe and your your your, your thought as broadly as possible. But I would imagine that you really, as you did with Project Row Houses, and I mean that in a way you have to start it in the community. So. Somehow, I, I, I mean, I've realized in traveling to some of these other cities about trying to set up uh, either the school, work with the school system, everyone is different, but, you know, uh, even with the, the cultural institutions, I mean, we have to really be there and we have to make it, it can't be studio, you know, in a school in New York, it really has to become Studio Institute Memphis, Studio Memphis. Institute Chicago, and that, that's really not always easy. And um, so, I mean, in an, inst an instance like this, it really takes, you know, your personal effort to stimulate people, I guess. I mean, it's unfortunate. I, I agree with you that wouldn't it be fantastic. I mean, I see a lot of things. I read about a lot of money spent on projects, and I think, but, <laughs> you know, and a lot of money is spent buying art. I mean, a vast amount of money, you know, for one work of art, and I think, you know, couldn't that be used in some way, and probably someone who can afford to do that could afford to do both, you know? <laughs> Uh, my uh, selfish and uh, biggest fear is that if you can give and you do give and you're successful, you're on the panel. If you fail at giving, you're the moderator. <laughs> those, those who can't moderate. <laughs> so stimulating. I, I'm sure there are a few questions that uh, we could turn the house lights up a bit. And we, have a we got one right over there. We have a microphone guy and a bandana. Let's start with this one over here. I, I could probably do it without the microphone. I think because they're recording, they're going to want you to be on the microphone. Four days later. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tiffany. Um, I enjoyed this immensely. Um, so it's really interesting hearing about working across communities and how um, segregation has really played a part in the work that you're doing. And I'm just wondering how um, educating your collaborators um, either helps or hinders that process. Like I think there's a way in which philanthropy can actually reinscribe segregation. So how do you work against that? Was that directed at a particular? Um, I think for both the land and What was the last part you said? The last part you said was sure. That, that they can to the to the point that people can give just to what they know. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make sure that arts philanthropy isn't reinscribing segregation? Right? How do you make sure that there's a reallocation of resources as opposed to just doing more of the same? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you know, I think just from my perspective, uh, as um, um, uh, you know, Dorothy said, you know, she, you know, she was saying that it's you know, it's part of my work is to go out and to, to be able to kind of expose people to different things, and that I mean, that's what I do. Just you know, I see that as being really a part of my role and what I do with my work is kind of. Uh, you know, having a, a, a platform in which, you know, people will somewhat listen to some of the things that I have. I can direct it in, in places. But from a systematic um, sense, I, you know, I really don't, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we just have to, um, I think as a country, you know, we have to admit that, you know, Race is such a still such a big issue. We failed that um, uh, desegregation. I mean, we're as in particular in the philanthropic world. I mean, it's major, uh, major segregated. And uh, and I think first of all, we just have to own that. You know, we have to just say that that is a problem, and we have to start thinking about how do we how do we move around it, and how do we. Um, you know, how do we train ourselves to, uh, particularly those in, in philanthropy, to, to be able to expand their notion of communities and worlds that they operate in. And that, you know, I don't know how the philanthropic world do it, dealing with that, but it's just, to me, it's a, it's a huge problem in terms of networks. In fact, you know, I, um, you know, I was, I was telling, um, I got a call from uh, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs in New York, and they were saying, they were saying, you know, we've been trying to figure this out about Wheatsville. You know, this is a very historic African American, you know, place in, in, in Brooklyn, and, and it's like, and you know, we city's given them money, and we've been trying to figure out how to, you know, help them, you know, stay afloat, and they just can't quite do it. They had this idea that they would, once they got kind of on a level ground, they were going to try to get at least, you know, seven new consistent donors of. $25,000 a year, I'm just thinking, in New York City? I mean, that's, you know, I mean, even a thing like Wheatsfield is struggling to get, you know, seven donors of $25,000, you know, I'm like, and, and so, you know, so my advice was like, look, you, so you've got, you have to get the philanthropic community to, um, to leverage themselves too, right? So if there's somebody on the museum, you know, if a foundation's giving money to somebody on the museum board, then say, look, well, you gotta give that, you gotta give somebody to this community-based uh, entity and start pre, you know, desegregating in that way by kind of shuffling boards around and connecting people in that way or something like that. But that's you know, that's just my, been my thinking on it. Yeah, I mean I mean, I think my view on that would be the first most important thing is just to be really, really aware and cognizant of the decisions that you're making and the impact that it's having. You know, we started the Flag Art Foundation in 2008, so now over 10 years ago, and we've had a female director, the same female director, Stephanie Roach, from the very beginning. And every single group show we do, we do Stephanie calls me up and says, Glenn, only 27% women. You know, and Glenn, you know, only 14% minority. You know, and so we are aware of it. And you know, that was just I'm a white male. I wasn't as aware of it as I as I should have been in 1998 or 2008. I'm aware of it every single time now. So now I I look at this and I say we need to get more women. We need to get more artists of color. We need to make it more balanced. And if you're aware of it, and it's not because they're not good. It's just you know that was the first thing that came to mind. We saw whatever that artist was, and, but you have to force yourself to be balanced and make it work. It's no secret, there is a lot of institutionalized racism in this country, right? So if we don't know aware of it, and we're not trying to tackle it, you know, I do work in the prisons, you know? Why do I see so many people of color in the prisons? I can tell you, we all know people, if they have a 15-year-old kid that was caught with cocaine, their family, if he was white, got a lawyer, and he, did, he got a, some, some sort of a, something, but it did not involve jail time. And if you're a 15 year old black kid in Harlem with cocaine, you're going to jail. And that should not be how our country works. That's not how anything should happen. We have, to, we, have to, we have to just be aware. We have to give to causes that focus on this stuff, that do it properly. And the only thing I would say about Rick, and look, one thing about the community, 
and, and different cultures and different people, you know, a lot of the Jewish community has historically been very, very aggressive in supporting other Jewish causes and other Jewish people in need and other things, and it's been a tradition. And not as many, not every community does that, and I'm not judging, but you know, we were, we were recently involved in a situation with a different culture, and they couldn't find anybody to support this, like literally, like one of the most important pieces of, 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 of something that would result in a, in a great benefit to this community, and they couldn't find anybody, and there were plenty of people that could afford it. And so I think everybody has to look at themselves more locally. I know all these super wealthy people of, of different ethnicities around the country in great cities that could use their capital, but they want to come and be on the board of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. You know, it's like, why? Why? Be on the board of your local museum. Be on the board of something local. Come and, and Join the International Council, you know, or something. But you don't need to, you know, or do both, you know. But there is, unfortunately, this draw of the big cities that people want to be involved in LACMA or in Lincoln Center or whatever, and that's fantastic. But I think people have to not forget their local communities need them. But if all the, the leaders and wealthy people in those small communities aspire to be on these me mega city boards and, and give them to the mega cities, it really depletes the, the power that you can have in your community. There's a question over here. Is that Florence? This has been quite fascinating. And um, in a way, what I have to comment on, or the question, is more addressed to Eric, uh, since he's not a panelist and just a moderator. <laughs> but um, let's assume that to create and make art is um, part of human nature and always has been. And I am fortunate in that my children and grandchildren are all gifted and are artists in one way or another and have all had the good fortune to go to schools where art was an in integral part of their education. There are schools, public schools mainly, across the country where art education doesn't exist. And you don't need to give millions of dollars. You need to have a local artist come in and teach a class on a volunteer basis, once a week, twice a week. You need to have your local supplier of pens and pencils make a donation. You need to do this kind of grassroots stuff because the departments of education are not doing it. It's too expensive, and what I propose here is not that expensive and I think will make a great difference in people's lives. That, that is exactly what Studio in a School does and uh, when Aggie Gunn, when, in 1974 when New York was about to go bankrupt, uh, they cut out all the arts programs and she was really upset, and she formed this organization, Studio in School. And what they do is come and set up a studio in a school. And uh, the school has to ask for it. The principal has to want it. And they usually pay for it with discretionary funds. But um, a lot of it is really a gift. And so we bring in the supplies. Uh, they have to give us a classroom. And we, it is usually the, the most underserved schools in the cities that are recipients, but some uh, principals want it in their school. It, it's actually a fantastic program. It goes from early childhood up to the upper grades, and so they do get the supplies, and people contribute to this uh, you know, organization, and that's why we're trying to bring it really to other cities. Um, uh, I, it's a really important, I mean, suddenly, you know, they're able to handle materials, they're learning new terms, they're learning words like collage. Uh, in New York City, a lot of these schools, the students are bilingual, and English is their second language. So, they, and they, you know, do programs where they've actually brought in something like, you know, healthy eating, healthy living, where the art is really about vegetables and, um, but you're right, a lot of these communities don't have the right kind of a supermarket. I do think that the, I, I, I think that a lot of racism came as a result of President Obama being, I mean, it, 
being president. I mean, it brought a lot of latent racism out in some way. And there, there, there is a big, I mean, there are places and people really like the Studio Museum in Harlem, Fiesta Gates, Mark Bradford, I mean, artists of color who are doing uh, a tremendous amount of work. And even when I see ads on television, I notice that, um, you know, they'll show mixed race children, they'll show. Mm -hmm. So it's really a matter of getting people kind of used to, to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a show at the Whitney Museum of, Mar of Modern Art, Black Male, and actually, uh, that was quite a number of years ago that I went to that with Roy on the last day of the show, and we were the only white people in the museum. And I mean, I want to say, you know, I, it, it really opened my eyes. I mean, there are sort of token number of African Americans at most of the events I go to. I mean, when Peter Jennings did his program for the Bridgehampton Child Care, community, it was really the only mixed uh, event out here. So, um, I mean, just having that kind of a personal experience, uh, I think that's... I mean, we, just, we all need to do more. We all need to do more. Yeah, I, I just uh, uh, loop back a, a little bit to the thing, the issue of uh, art education. Um, I think we uh, think about art education in a wrong way. Um, I think that the within the the, the you know elementary schools and, and kindergartens and the, those kind of programs should be focused on creativity. Uh, creativity is, is something that we're all capable of, and uh, it's something that um, is. Uh, is going to enhance everything that we do in life once we get a comfort and a skill set related to the, the creative act, the creative imagination within any context. So we should focus on creativity and stop calling it art. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the mistake we make is thinking that creativity is art. But it's not uh, the same way that throwing a baseball isn't professional baseball. Those are two different activities. Sandlot baseball is, is a game that's played and great satisfaction and skill sets come out of it and some actually go on to develop those skill sets further and further and further and then become professional athletes. Uh, that, that's the difference between creativity and art. It's, art is a whole other set of skill sets that comes out of that. So let's stop thinking about it that. The other thing is we should stop thinking about art as an institutional form for learning because it's, it's not. Uh, you know, I went to an art school uh, and the I mean, I went to several art schools, actually. So, um, I went to uh, a junior college where you would take a class or not take a class or something. If you got serious about it, maybe get an associate degree, two-year degree or something, go on to something else. Then I went to, I, which I did for a year, then I went on to a BFA program, right, in, an, in a larger university which was more regimented as an educational system. There were classes you had to take, time spent on, you know, work outside of blah, 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 other, other classes you had to take. And, uh, uh, and I did that for a year. And then I, I went to Cal Arts, where it was an art school that was full of all different kinds of arts, from, you know, uh, a dance, theater, film, you know, uh, visual arts, music, etc. Uh, this was the end of the 60s, and the best thing about it was you could graduate whenever you wanted to. <laughs> and, and what that did was it, it made you feel like you were there to learn something that would enable you on your own 
to move forward into this thing that you were doing. So it, it wasn't that, you know, and what I find as a, teaching, a teacher of art is that some students should get out of school right away. They're already <laughs> ready. But they've got two more years. They're going for a degree because they need to get a job, you know, da da da. So th that whole system, I think, is really screwed up. And we ought to start thinking about our, that more along what you're talking about in Florence, which is this idea kind of going back to apprenticeships, going back to workshops, going back to a direct exchange between a professional and, a, and somebody who you know, wants to learn how to draw or do something specific that isn't connected to a, another system of, of you know, uh, education or finance or blah, blah, blah. So. They do that at Guild Hall here. They have a, a fairly aggressive program, educational program, where they do bring in artists to work. What was the name of the woman who did the beach thing? You know, you know, one of the more complicated uh, ways to look at your, your, your the, the problem you, you've put out, and you know, Eric, you talked about this, about not talking about art, creativity, whatever, is really, the truth of the matter is, as a species, we're, we're born creative. And we do it. So the real process is to figure out how do we stop crushing the creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's what that's what happens in the, in the process is that as you get up, as you continue through the process of education, it, it begins to be much more about these practical functions. And then and so that we haven't figured out how we can integrate the need for creativity in these practical functions as opposed to just crushing it. And that's to me is a more complicated way of dealing with that. Yeah. We have a, I have to go to my wife. Say, You're right. <laughs> right here, right here. I just wanted to go back for one second to um, like Eric when you first made your list about all the things that, that comprise the art ecosystem, there was one thing that you didn't say, and it's it's sort of germane to what we were just talking about now, which is that it's really important that there's a creatively receptive audience. Like the public, a receptive public is, is super important. And that means I think that all of the philanthropic effects have to allow for a sense of invitation to everybody to participate. I think that's like really critical. And I was thinking, Rick, when you were talking about um, Tulsa, if one thing that one thing that people do share, no matter what, what their backgrounds are, is history. And history is an incredible narrative that we can all appreciate and get behind. For some people, history and the shame that white people feel about Tulsa, should feel about Tulsa, is something that nevertheless should be an important part of their of their their world. I mean it's it, history is like a, is something that I think has been really important for me thinking about Sag Harbor and hoping that it gets preserved and hoping that it remains intact because anybody who goes to that town sees it and they, they get a sense of it. And they, they're not quite sure what it is, but they know they really like it and there's this and that that's old, like the variety store or whatever, but I think there's also a deeper sense of there having been lives lived and the complexity of those lives and the fact that it's a diverse place. And I'm sure that I have been to Tulsa, I know about I know about well, Black Wall Street. It's one of the most horrific things on earth. But the fact that like not everybody in this audience probably knows about it is something that's very very wrong. It's like a shared history, and people like to hear a story. They might not like to hear that story when they when they know it. But in fact, I think that just making sure that history doesn't die. I I just was told that there are some colleges now that don't offer history, and I was like. What the what? How is this even possible? So just to like, to I think that all of these things, the creativity, the public imagination, the willingness of people to learn and to listen to a, a fascinating story should be part of the way that um, creative endeavors and philanthropy 
go out into a community, into any community. And I believe, I'm you know, a big believer in act local. <laughs> because that's otherwise, how can we possibly get our heads around everything that's wrong? Dorothy, when you were talking about species extinction, oh my god. You know, but it's, it's true unless you just kind of start where you can and do what you can and then let yourself expand. And there's no reason to not give to, you know, wild aid or whatever, but, um, et cetera. I'm gonna, uh, we, we have uh, two people who are not from here. Okay. I know, but well, <laughs> before we do, let's hear from Houston and then from uh, Brazil on this. He's come all the way from Rio to talk about this. So let, let's go with Houston first, finish with Brazil, and, and we're out of here. Games, and I thought it was interesting how you use games and domino playing in Project Grow Houses. Would you talk about that a bit? Well, the, the, the idea of, of, of gaming, you know, I, you know, I think one of my, I mean, Hiram's referencing this notion that I started doing these paintings based on games, domino patterns and stuff, and watching how patterns through games have these complexities. And um, Are you, you know, saying your dealer is getting you to talk about your paintings. Yeah. He's, he's very clever. <laughs> he's, very, he's, he's very clever there. But <laughs> how you do dominoes to develop the neighborhood. Yeah, but but the, yeah. So you know, but you know, so beyond all, like the you know the the personal interest that I have in it, it becomes one of those ways of really figuring out how you create proximity with others through things that are not. You know, um, as, as a friend of mine said, one of the great things about dominoes is that you can sit around and you can play this game all day and you can make these kind of incredible decisions for the game that has no consequences. And, you know, outside of that, you know, and uh, that's it if you're not gambling. But, uh, but you know, and it, and it is a way that, you know, you start to kind of expand, you know, these notions of these circles. The, the way that I found the neighborhood in, in, in Athens, the way that I was able to be embraced in that neighborhood, I was walking through and I was trying to find the location, the place and all this stuff, and I saw like a bunch of men hover around. And I was like, what do they do? And I went and looked, and they were playing dominoes. So, and they were mostly Albanian and some Greek, whatever, and I'm like looking at them, and I was, they weren't playing the kind of games that I need, but I watched long enough that I could kind of figure it out. And eventually I said, you know, can I play, you know, whatever. They didn't, they didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and I played, and now to this day, when I, I'm going to Greece tomorrow, and when I get there on Monday, you know, mid-afternoon, the Albanians be, be sitting there waiting on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, it's these kind of ways of extending communities in ways that kind of, are you losing that much money that they're, uh, <laughs> Let's go to Rodrigo and finish this up. Hi. Uh, so I'm Rodrigo from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm part of a collective group of artists from Rio, and we're here in an arts and residency program. Um, I heard such amazing stories here and I couldn't help of thinking of this wider notion of the ecosystem. And since we come from an undeveloped country, such as Brazil, where art in such few hands, of few people and few galleries, and uh, with no political uh, initiatives in arts, and I was wondering if Glenn ever have a, a wider uh, program about uh, bring, doing what you do in other countries, and hopefully we'll have you in Brazil as well. So, I think that's all. I will say that the, uh, the the art world is an amazing world, and it is a global world, and um, it is very common for people to call me that I don't know that are from Brazil or from China or from Japan and say, you know, I've read about you, can I come see your collection or can I have a coffee with you or what have you. And, you know, I do the same thing when I travel. If I'm going to Munich, I might call somebody and say, who are the, you know, good collectors in Munich to go meet. And, 
it is a very global, a global thing, and so that is a great, a great thing. We collect artists from Brazil, we collect artists from Africa, we collect artists from all throughout Asia. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think that it goes back to what I said before. It is setting an example, and there are a lot of collectors around the world that see what the types of things that we do. There are philanthropists that see the types of things that we do, and we, hopefully, it inspires somebody to do something similar on a local level. There are a lot of flag art foundations being set up all over the world, and I'm not saying I invented the concept, but there certainly are people that are doing similar things based on inspiration. You know, I was inspired by some things that Eli Bro did. I was inspired by many things that Aggie Gunn did. Uh, and we're all going to be hopefully inspired by the great deeds that others are doing, and if that can kind of spread through the internet much more broadly and much wider than ever before, so that then local people can benefit and that you can do these types of things. You know, we went to India, we met with a group of artists in India, we went to studios, we went to, 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 to meet people and eat with people. I think the other thing like playing games, food, you know, sharing a meal with somebody. You know, we were on the, on the Syrian border and we had lunch with an Arab family in their home. It was one of the most delicious meals I've ever had. And, and literally out the window we're looking at Syria and, and you know, a really war ravaged, ravaged situation and yet we were so local and so warm and, and it was a beautiful thing. So the more interactions that we can have like that, the better it is for everybody and every local community will get better. So again, all we can all do is just try to lead by example. Just I've got three little children, I try to live my life by example so that they can see and, and, and try to follow in the way just that I have with my beautiful parents who have been married for 65 years and you know, set an example for me every day of their lives, um, I think we can all just continue to try to do that. I, I want to uh, absolutely thank this uh, fabulous uh, group of people. And all of Uh, book that, uh, the Flag Art Foundation 10 year anniversary book is on sale and in, uh, in out front and all the proceeds go to Guild Hall so it's a, it's a nice little philanthropic thing to end a very stimulating uh, afternoon. Thank you all for coming.